courses you're interested in taking is really going to determine how you need to structure your practice. Or, depending upon how much money you've got to play with, you may need to look at financial considerations first and then say, depending upon what financial considerations I need to make will determine the types of cases that I'm able to take. For example, if you want to look at it first from a substantive point you, you can say to yourself, you know, what are the issues that move my heart the most? Do I want to be involved in, in dog fighting, animal abuse, cruelty issues, etc.? Do I want to really attack the issue of standing and try to be able to gain standing for animals through courts of law? Uh, you can look at it in terms of, you know, what types of animals do my, does my heart go out to the most? Do I want to help farm animals? Do I want to be engaged in wildlife issues? Whatever. So you kind of take a look at what is it that you really want to do the most? And what I say to people, not just not, not necessarily even for, for practice in animal law, but as a general matter, when people say, well, how did you end up in this, or what should I do with myself for a living? I always find, you, know, you say to yourself, what would I do for free? And if you can figure out what it is you would do for free, if you can make money at it, that's just gravy. So. Next thing that you need to consider if you're going to be in business is how am I going to actually earn money at this? And here's where the, the two kinds of concepts you need to look at sort of mesh and will probably conflict for a lot of people. Um, animal law is a business just like any other sort of business and you really do have to treat it that way. And if you want to take cases, for example, on an hourly rate basis, that's great. If you can actually find people to pay you money to do the kinds of things you want to do. That's fabulous. There's some upsides to this, and there are some downsides to this. If you find hourly rate work, or rather if you take hourly rate work, you're going to be more likely to be able to pay your monthly bills, which is cool. We all want to be able to pay our monthly bills. However, it is probably going to significantly, significantly limit the kinds of cases you're going to be able to take. Chances are the only people who are going to pay you to represent them are people who are involved in companion animal cases because those are the people who view their animals as members of the family and would be more likely, if anything, to retain a lawyer for legal services on behalf of their companion animals, just like they might retain a veterinarian for medical services on behalf of their animals. So if you take hourly rate work, chances are you're never going to be involved in things like trying to force open the inner workings of an IACUC for animal research issues. Chances are you're not going to be able to work on farm animal issues because the farmers who are the ones who, if anybody, would have standing to bring a case regarding their animal are the ones who are generally hurting the animals. So they're not going to be bringing lawsuits. I mean, if you happen to find a farmer who's engaged in some sort of turf war with another farmer, maybe. But by and large, looking at hourly rate work, you're probably going to be looking at only at companion animal issues. And you still may need to take other types of cases to supplement your income. There's no guarantee you can actually earn a full-time living at it. And my best suggestion is if you want to try, you probably need to be in a major city so you have as many potential customers as possible to draw from as a base. And you want to set yourself up in a wealthy neighborhood, quite frankly, or some, some urban area with pockets of rich people who might be interested in spending money on these kinds of issues. Um, another possibility is to take contingency claims. Now, this, if you take cases that offer attorney fee provisions, it's going to widen up the amounts of cases, the types of cases that you take. Um, but you're still going to probably need non-animal cases as a source of income. For example, what are some types of contingency fee cases? Well, uh, most states have consumer fraud statutes. And most state consumer fraud statutes provide for recovery of attorney fees in the event of a successful outcome. So if you're looking, for example, at suing a breeder who is continually churning out defective animals that's got a lot of issues bound up in it, one of the issues is probably going to be a consumer fraud. Okay, so you can probably take a case like that if you're able to finance yourself in the meantime on a contingency fee basis because if you're able to prove your case and recover, there would be the possibility of getting attorney fees. Now, of course, the downside to the upside is you can take a wider array of cases than just the hourly rate. And the downside is you have to be able to finance yourself in the meantime, which means you're going to have to take other work, which is probably not going to have anything to do with animals whatsoever. Um, or you need to have some other sort of income coming in some form or fashion um, 
to be able to support yourself so you can make your monthly rent payments on your office and you can pay your monthly phone bills, et cetera, et cetera, until you're able to resolve the case and have that income come in. Um, and even on a contingency basis, you need to keep in mind that there's still a lot of types of cases, depending upon how your state law is configured, that you're not going to be able to take when they only permit recovery on the basis of, uh, attorney fees rather, on the basis of the total recovery. It's going to vary from state to state, but I practice in Illinois. So I'll, I'll use Illinois as an example. That's what I'm most familiar with. Medical malpractice. You're allowed as an attorney, depending upon what stage in the proceedings you get to, to take roughly a third of the award. Now that's fine if you're talking about a traumatic brain injury or a wrongful birth of a baby or something like that where you can anticipate a very large recovery. Um, so if you are in litigation for a year, but ultimately you can recover a million dollars, most people plaintiff attorneys will take that risk. For an animal case, it's quite possible that you can litigate the case for a year or two years or more. And even if you get a phenomenal recovery in a medical malpractice case for a veterinary malpractice, there was just an award in California, we're going to talk about that more in a little bit, for $39,000, which to the best of my knowledge is the largest veterinary malpractice award ever. So you take a third of $39,000, you're still only talking about $17,000 or so. The case went on for several years. So as a practical business consideration, you cannot litigate something for two or three years and then recover $17,000. You'll be out of business. You're not helping yourself. You're not helping animals. You're not helping anybody. It's a harsh reality. Everybody would love to help animals. But if you're going to do it as a business, you need to actually keep in mind business considerations. Pro bono. Very popular with Everybody loves to take cases pro bono. I'm not, it's wonderful to do that. I take cases pro bono, but it's got to be a balanced portion of your caseload um, because pro bono is exactly what it says it is. You're not making any money from it whatsoever, which means you must have income coming in from other sources. You take a job with a large firm. You may say, well, I hate this large firm job, but it pays the bills, et cetera, et cetera, and I can take work on the side pro bono, which is great. In those instances, you can take any sort of case that moves you, no matter how, what other hurdles there might be. If you're not charging the client, that's usually the, the key to the courtroom door. They'll come and sign with you, but then you need to make sure that you're able to support yourself in some other mechanism. And you, and you need to keep in mind, too, if you take a job with a large firm, it still depends what the firm is. You know, you can take a job with some place and maybe make forty or 50000 a year, and have roughly a 40, 50 hour work week, and then yes, you might have time to do some pro bono. You're not getting paid a lot, but be, it'll be enough you can live. If you take a job with a firm where you're making 100 plus salary a year, and the starting associate salaries now are up to major markets, somewhere is around the 125 mark, those places expect you to work 70, 80, 90 hours a week. So if you're working 80 hours a week, if you can find time to take pro bono work plus your 80 hour work week schedule, God bless and, and go to it, that can be very, very, very draining because not many people can keep up an 80 plus hour work week schedule plus cases on the side. And there's other considerations that you need to take into account at that point as well. When you work for other people and you're taking other kinds of cases on the side, it has to fit in with your firm culture. You know, if your partner loves hunting, they're not going to want you working on some pro bono project to try to ban hunting in your neighborhood. Okay. Now, if your firm represents Tyson Foods, they're not going to want you picking up pro bono work for Farm Sanctuary or you know, United Poultry Concerns. So you have a lot of considerations in that regard to take into account before you're able to do anything. So if your biggest you know, goal in life is you really want to work on farming issues, you can't, for example, go work for a firm that represents agribusiness. Um, the upside, though, of taking pro bono cases is that you really can take any case that moves your heart be anything, uh, any, any sort of case, including types of cases that clients might normally pay for. For example, if somebody wanted you to set up a pet trust for their companion animals, you can take that pro bono if you want. But you want to keep in mind, too, um, you're running a business. And is there really a value to doing for free something that somebody would otherwise pay for? Um, the types of examples I've got set up on the screen are sorts of things that clients normally pay for, and you ought to keep those kinds of things in mind as a business consideration before you agree.
free to go do whatever for anybody for no money whatsoever. Um, any nonprofit on the planet would love to have their corporate, have themselves incorporated and have them registered with the IRS for tax exempt status for free, not just animal issues. Any nonprofit for any type of issue whatsoever would love to get help for free. The fact of the matter is, if they don't get free help, they will pay for it. And harsh as it sounds, let them pay for it. You know, I think that part of the problem in getting society in general to accept this as a serious movement a serious social issue is that for so many years everything has been completely underfunded and non-funded and it's like a badge of honor to be poverty stricken. Part of what I personally believe is going to propel this movement into the 21st century mainstream is that everybody's got to realize that this functions just like anything else. It runs on money. And you shouldn't be afraid to value your services and get paid for your services. Not to say not to do any pro bono or whatever. I do plenty of pro bono too. There's always going to be a soft spot in your heart for some whatever it is that comes along. But as a general matter, don't feel afraid to say, this is my time and it's valuable. And if you want my professional advice, it's something that you should pay for. Okay. Now, before you take any kind of case, and I realize there's some people in here that are practicing attorneys and this is going to be old hat, and there's some people in here maybe considering what to do with themselves for the rest of their career and so hopefully this won't be old hat for everybody in the room. You've got to really consider the merits of the case. Okay? Look at the claim, first of all. If it's, an animal, if it's related to an animal and you really want to get involved in animal law, you need to kind of look at it and say to yourself, is this really an animal law claim or is it just a claim that happens to involve an animal in it? It may, for example, really be an American with Disabilities Act claim. If a guy gets turned down, uh, you know, if somebody, a uh, service dog is not allowed into a public accommodation. Is it really animal law? Well, it's got an animal in it, but it's really an ADA claim. You can still get involved if you want to, but it may not, the more you look into it, be the kind of case that you think you're taking on, just because it involves an animal. You have to look at the clients. What are the client's goals? Okay, If a client comes in with a really tragic story about something that happened to their pet and their goal is to get a million dollars, are not going to be able to help this person because no matter how horrific it is, they're not. Nobody anywhere in any jurisdiction in the U.S. is getting million-dollar awards for anything. You're not going to be able to help this person. Uh, likewise, if the client's goal is to be purely vindictive against the tortfeasor, that's not a legitimate purpose of the civil justice system, and you need to be careful about that as well. So you want to do your client screening just as carefully for this as for any other area of law, and you don't want to take cases where six months down the road you're going to be wringing your hands saying, oh my God, what did I do? Um, you, you may also want to look at what side you're on. Uh, one benefit, for example, to being in private practice is you can decide what cases you want to take and what cases you want to turn down. I know me personally, um, somebody will call me their dog has bitten someone. Maybe I'll take the case and maybe I won't. It First of all, I don't represent dog fighters, drug dealers. I do get those phone calls. And you know what? Those are hard cases to turn down because those people are willing to pay. And if they don't get their services from me, they're going to go to some other criminal defense attorney. And you know what? Criminal defense attorneys in Chicago, maybe you can get somebody for $250 an hour. Maybe it's like $300 an hour. It's a lot of money to turn down, but I find those cases personally repugnant, so I won't take dog fighting cases. Now, on the other hand, if you know, some numbnut accidentally leaves his fence open, the dog gets out, bites somebody, and the local warden wants to put the dog down because it got out and bit some other dog or other person, that I'd be more inclined to take. It's not really the dog's fault. It's the stupid owner's fault. Um, so you need to take a look at what size you're on. Maybe I want this case. Maybe I don't. But again, it's a lot of weighing back and forth because, quite frankly, the cases where you're likely to make the most money with drug fight, with the dog fighting, drug dealing, that kind of thing. It's a personal decision. And the truth of the matter is, everybody's entitled to a lawyer. So you could decide to make a different decision than what I made, and that's fine too. Um, if you take away nothing else from this talk today, what I would like everybody to remember is that animal law is a business like any other area of law. I've been to a whole bunch of these conferences and people talk about all sorts of horrible issues with animals and yes, it's all very tragic and the one thing that 
nobody ever really talks about is that this is still a business. Treat it like a business. If you don't treat your business like a business, you will go out of business. It may sound harsh, but that's the way the entire rest of the world works. And if you want to get in there and be competitive, if you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with all the insurance companies that are defending the doctors who commit medical malpractice, with all the insurance companies that represent all the other assorted tort feasors out there, with all of the agribusinesses that are committing horrible practices, you need to bring the same sorts of skills and resources to bear as any other corporate lawyer or litigation attorney at any major firm in this country. And you don't do it by being touchy-feely. You can be touchy-feely on your own at home when nobody's looking. But when you come to work and you go to court, you've got to be prepared. It's a business. You've got to evaluate every case you take from a business perspective. And if you really decide every once in a while to take something because it really moves your heart, that's OK. And I'm not saying to never, ever do that. But you have to be really cognizant that that's what you're doing. OK. Well, I've covered a bunch of this already. You have to be a good business person because if you don't stay in business, you're not able to help anybody. Do all the same sorts of things that anybody in any other sort of business would do. You need to set up a professional shop, okay? If people are going to hire you as a lawyer, they don't really want to see you walking around in jeans and having client meetings sitting in your backyard. Set up a professional shop. You need to walk the walk, talk the talk, look like any other attorney. Um, invest in marketing, advertising, have a website. Join professional associations. Develop business relationships with other attorneys. They need to know you're out there. They need to know you're serious. So, you know, when somebody calls you for a DUI, well, maybe you refer that to the criminal defense lawyer down the street. And when somebody calls him because, you know, their cat died at the vet's office, this guy needs to know to have that person call you. As with any other business, need to evaluate these claims carefully. There's lots of tragic things that happen to animals all the time, but you know what? Lots of tragic things happen to people all the time, too. You can't take a case simply because it's a sad story. Okay? If there's something seriously flawed from a legal perspective, if it's past all the applicable statutes of limitations, if for some reason you are not going to be able to prove an element of a claim, you have to be able to look the person in the eye and say, I am really sorry this happened to you, but I'm not going to be able to represent you. Um, I work in a suite with other attorneys, and there's a guy next door to me that does medical malpractice, and I hear him say that to his clients all the time. I'm sorry this happened, but I'm not going to be able to help you really. Yes, you know, an animal got hurt, it was tragic, whatever, but just like with people cases, you have to know your limitations. Um, you have to screen your clients carefully. If you're going to be taking hourly rate work, you expect to get paid up front, it's a business relationship, get paid, send regular bills, expect regular payments. Do the same sort of client screening you would do for any other type of case. If a client comes in and their story doesn't add up, if they're not answering your questions, if they're being a problem for whatever reason, go with your gut and turn the case down. There will be somebody else in your office next week who's also going to have some sort of problem and you want to allocate your resources wisely and apply them where you think you will genuinely be able to do the most good. Final business thought. If you are the sort of person that absolutely, unconditionally has to help every single animal that comes through, don't practice law. There's lots of things you can do to help in this movement. There's all kinds of advocacy groups you can work with. The law does not provide a remedy for every single wrong. And you need to keep that in mind. It's very frustrating. But just like with people cases, if you can't do, if the law doesn't provide a remedy, you have to be able to say, as a business decision, I'm very sorry that this happened to you. I'm not going to be able to take your case. OK. Enough talk about being in business. So OK, so you're in business. And whether you're set up as a solo practitioner or maybe a small practice with one or two other people and you focus on animal rights uh, or animal law issues, or even if you're working for some other organization and majority of your practice constitutes something else, and you just simply want to take cases on the side, what types of cases can you take? And I'll run through briefly some of the substantive areas that I'm familiar with, um, which is mainly companion animal issues. Um, and then Adam's going to talk about some of the areas he's familiar with. As most people probably know, the very biggest hurdles in 
taking any sort of case involving companion animals involves standing, and it involves non-economic damages. Uh, those two topics could in and of themselves be entire hour-long sessions of discussion, um, but those are obviously two issues to keep in mind. When someone walks into your office, am I going to be able to bring a case for them? Well, if it's a pet owner regarding their pet, the answer is pretty straightforward, yes. If it's not, and you've got a lot of other issues, and Adam's going to be talking about that in a little bit. What do you do when you don't have a clear-cut method into court, or clear-cut plaintiff to get yourself into court? The issue of non-economic damages is another really cutting-edge issue in animal law. Um, so you need to take a look at something. For example, most of the cases I take, I rarely take a case where the animal is still alive. It sounds really harsh. But the fact of the matter is, for any sort of non-economic damage argument you're going to make, it's a much, much, much more difficult argument if the animal's not dead. Uh, Illinois, for example, there is a case that came down from the appellate court that encompasses the area where Chicago was located just this past year that said uh, loss of companionship is not allowed in non-fatally injured cases involving children, human children. So clearly, if they're not going to allow loss of companionship for a non-fatally injured child, they're not going to allow loss of companionship as an element damages for a non-fatally injured animal. So again, it might be a horrible situation, but you need to evaluate from a business perspective, am I going to be able to do something for this person? And you need to have that conversation with the client right up front. And I will tell people, you know, on the one hand, the fact that your pet hasn't died is good because you still have this, you know, companion around as a friend. I said, on the other hand, this, this is not good for your case. Now, of course, I have a lot of clients where animal is dead and they would switch places with you in a heartbeat. So it's, it's good news and not good news. And you just be right up front and explain about damage issues and if they want to proceed, they can then proceed and on a fully informed basis. Veterinary malpractice. If you look at, at uh, areas of substantive law, tort law, uh, a lot of my caseload involves medical, veterinary malpractice. I choose to treat it like a medical malpractice action rather than a property damage action under Illinois law, you're going to have greater avenues to recovery, at least theoretically. Um, but of course, then you have to go the full route and treat it like a medical malpractice action. In my state, for example, there's a statutory requirement that you have to have an expert report prior to filing. So I have a veterinary expert that will review records and um, give an opinion, has to write a formal report before I sign, uh, sign off and file on anything. You need to know what the elements for your state are. Every state is going to be different. Um, you need to check for statutory hurdles like having an expert report. One really good new case to draw to everybody's attention is this Bluestone case in California with the $39,000 award. Uh, to the, again, to the best of my knowledge, that's the highest veterinary malpractice award so far in the US. There's all kinds of cases involving emotional harms. Um, or I should say there's several causes of action which can encompass a whole range of circumstances. Intentional and negligent infliction of emotional distress. You need to know the elements for your state. And in a lot of states, particularly, negligent infliction is going to be a very, very high hurdle to meet. Because a lot of states have contemporaneous injury requirements, uh, zone of danger requirements. So you need to know what's out there. And then you need to be able to make arguments why you can overcome those hurdles. Um, there, are, there have been several instances where there have been fairly substantial awards for emotional harm, and I've got them listed here on the screen and in the handout, and that might be useful to saying to a judge, look, you know, these kinds of cases are being taken seriously, and here's some instances where substantial awards were made. And of course, the more closely you can analogize to any of those fact patterns, the better off you are. I find, as a general matter, courts are more willing to accept the proposition that an individual person do some egregious thing, and they're less willing to adopt a mindset to acknowledge that maybe a veterinarian could do something egregious. So, so far, I think you've, what we've seen is that there's more likely, if anything, to be larger awards for individual tort feasors. Um, negligent infliction, there's really very little good case law out there. And if you can't find a good new case, then you have to go back to something, you know, a golden oldie, as it were. And Campbell versus Quarantine, which I, I would imagine most of you guys are familiar is still probably the best case out there for negligent infliction. And what you need to do in instances where you don't have good new case law to rely on 
ways. You can say to the court, look, this came out more than 20 years ago, and it really didn't open up the whole parade of terribles. We don't get negligent infliction for property loss claims all over the U.S., and there's no reason not to allow it here if your only concern is that it's going to open up the floodgates. Uh, there's other types of negligence actions you can bring. It would be largely determined dependent upon what your state's uh, laws provide. For example, in Illinois, we now have a civil provision in the state's anti-cruelty statute. So an individual can sue another individual for alleged wrongdoing to their companion animal, regardless of whether or not the state brings a criminal prosecution. Not every state has that. In fact, most states don't. But once you get familiar with each of your own individual state's laws, there may be specific causes of action in there. And God willing, they'll have statutory provisions for attorney fees and maybe even punitive damages. And you can use those as vehicles for bringing suits. I also do uh, some condominium and uh, zoning types of issues. Um, for example, somebody lives with a dog for 10 years, and the condo board changes, and the new board says, your dog has to go. Well, what do you do? Well, the first thing you need to do is read your condominium, read the client's condominium documents. See what's in there. See if there's really a prohibition in there. See if you can make grandfather arguments that the dog's been there long enough. See if there's other waiver arguments you can make. Um, if there's been a recent change to the bylaws, you've got to get in there and read exactly what is in those documents and find out, did the board follow its own policies and procedures in enacting the rule change? If it didn't, then you can attack it from this was not validly, validly enacted. Of course, even if you succeed in getting it struck down, they will likely just go and, and reenact the provision in a valid manner, um, but it buys some time. And they may ultimately back down if it turns out that enough of the unit owners in the building are objecting to the change in policy. Um, there is actually a fairly good, oh, and I'll also um, check to see, depending upon what the specific fact pattern is, if it's a claim having to do with person who has a therapy dog, for example, you may have a lot of other claims bound up in there. So don't forget to check for things like ADA claims or Fair Housing Act claims, which can be pretty powerful tools and do provide for things like a recovery of attorney fees. Um, I've got one good case listed here from California, um, which if you're doing a condominium law case, you may want to read this as well just to get some ideas of types of arguments you can make to defeat uh, condo board saying we've got unilateral discretion to do whatever we want to do and we say no pets. Um, zoning, same types of thing. You need to read the ordinance. I had a case at one point where the, woman got a, the client got a threatening letter from her local town. You're in she had about eight cats. So you're in violation of the ordinance. Well, I read the ordinance. You know what? There was no pet limit on the ordinance. So I wrote a letter back to the town supervisor, whoever the, the municipal attorney, like, you know, I'm reading the ordinance. There's no limit. What are you talking about? So his next move was to write me a letter back. We've decided to, she's a pet shop, and she's in violation. She's not, she doesn't have a license. She has more than two animals, and she's not licensed. So I wrote him a letter back, and I'm like, this is a woman who's been living in this private residential neighborhood for in excess of 30 years, paying property taxes on her single family home. If you don't cease and desist, I'm going to seek a declaratory judgment asking the court to determine that my client is not a pet shop. Stupid, but they back down. You know. So know what's in your ordinance. Um, and even if the ordinance does provide for some sort of limitation, then, then the argument becomes, well, what is the limitation? Does it apply to my client? I mean, if your client's got a pot-bellied pig and there's been an ordinance in effect since the 1800, no pot-bellied pigs, it's a losing argument. You've got to tell the client you can fight for a change, okay, but you're probably better off going through other such as the legislative process in those types of instances. Um, you may be able to make analogies to cases where, like this case in Illinois, it was a pet monkey. Technically, pet monkeys weren't allowed, but they made analogies. This is really like a, a pet dog or cat because it's lived with the owner since birth, et cetera, et cetera. Look for creative arguments. Contract law. And then, I mean, I could go on in great and gruesome detail here, but contract law is useful for things or disputes involving puppy mills, breeders, uh, kennels, bailment situations. Recoveries can be sort of limited. So what you want to take a look for is if there's any way you can allege fraud in any of these situations that gets you into the whole tort arena and, ta-da, gets you into consumer law. That's a really powerful tool. If 
you can ever find a way to take any contract-related claim and make a good faith argument sounding in tort and bring it into the contract or the consumer fraud arena, do it because those are powerful tools. Um, some other areas of law that I am not terribly involved in, but if you are interested in, I can just give you some resources so you can learn more about it. Pet custody is becoming a very hot issue, and petcustody.com has some good resources to get you started. I have dabbled very briefly in divorce law, but nothing to do with animals, so I can't really talk too specifically about that. Animals are considered property under the law. Most judges really only look at that as a division of assets, and you have to be the goal is to try to get them to look at it in terms of best interests of the dog. Um, estate planning. More than half the states in the U.S. now have forcible provisions for pet trusts, which means that it is no longer okay to simply give your money to somebody in hopes they take care of your dog, and that person could actually go take the dog to the pound for euthanasia and take the money on vacation. A forcible trust means your wishes can be honored after you go, and so that might be um, a type of practice area where everybody Eventually, everybody's going to die. Hopefully, everybody makes plans for themselves before they go. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there now for estate planning for pets, and this is one website that's um, got a good comprehensive list. It's a good place to start. So that is the presentation, and I will turn it over to Adam now, who will talk about all other sorts of causes of law involved in. Thank you. Hopefully you can bear with me while I get set up here. I wanted to follow up on a number of points uh, based on Amy's presentation. So just a few other things. When you're, when you're take, I think the business angle is very important to talk about, and I would like to spend a few minutes on it. Hybrid contingency is another way that you can take these cases. You know, if you rely on pure contingency, they're going to go broke most of the time. But another way to do it is to ask your client to put up, say, a flat rate, maybe 500 bucks plus a reduced percentage for the pre-filing and if you have to actually turn on a file suit, then ask for another sort of fixed, non-refundable installment, and then ratchet up your contingent fee by another 10%. And if it appeals, do the same thing. Um, that at least will give you a little flow of money um, without waiting for a year or two to get the money. Another option is seeking grants. You know, a lot of us can't front costs, and defense attorneys know that. And they'll try to bury you with deposition costs. They'll depose everyone in sight, and the only way you're going to is by ordering a copy. And court reporters, bless them. My wife's a court reporter, but I'll tell you, it is a burden, especially in our cases. So, do what I do and beg. Beg from uh, a great organization, the Animal Legal Defense Fund. They have a projects and litigation committee, and you can, every month, they will entertain proposals uh, for getting grants. And often, I don't know, they'll do a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks, or whatever. If they think the case has merit, they're willing to uh, help fund it. I don't know if there are other organizations who do that, but in Whatcom County in Washington, there's a civil rights project, and they do have a little bit of a way to help sow the seeds in litigation that local attorneys are willing to take pro bono or on straight contingency. So look into that. Market expansion lines. Now, you know, like Amy's in a big city, right? So she's in Chicago, and I was in Seattle, but I moved to Bellingham, which is a small town right up near the Canadian border. But because there are so few of us who take a large number of cases, and frankly, if you're going to do animal law and you don't want to dabble in other areas, you're going to have to grab that niche and hold on to it tight. And you're going to have to expand your practice beyond the geographical borders of most basically one or two counties. You may have to push into other big cities or even statewide. So if you're going to do that, consider a market expansion line uh, because you'll pay a little bit each month. They'll be able to call a local number. So to them, they'll think you're there, even though you're not there, a local area code, but it'll then ship right up to your office remote handle the call or maybe associate with local attorneys and split fees so that you can still have a presence. 
another real factor on the flip end is instead of putting money out um, in order to um, make sure that the litigation progresses, there's also the risk of you putting out money to the other side or to the court for sanctions. And you know, increasingly, I don't know if this is saying something about how I practice, but increasingly a number of defense lawyers are pushing for CR 11. And I think that uniquely as animal law attorneys, we need to be very mindful about the risk of sanctions, especially in the climate where judges and the public I think have some sort of a, we think that what we're doing is perhaps a little bit frivolous, or um, we're asking for far too much, and there's a backlash. Even though it's undeserved, it's a reality. So be mindful of CR 11. Um, again, that comes in, comes in part in evaluating the case. Your heart may be in it, but if, if it is truly baseless, don't take it. There are also some statutes to be aware of. In Washington, OCW 385 says that if the whole action itself is frivolous and advanced without reasonable cause, not you, but your client's going to get sacked from legal sanctions. And then there are malicious prosecution statutes that can also mean um, um, There's also the issue of ethics and how you take cases. Now, for me, there are a couple of points where I feel strongly I'm, I'm concerned about getting what would be considered blood money. I have clients whose animals might be spayed profits on lost progeny or lost stud fees or whatever. I deeply believe in spay neuter of all dogs and cats. But appropriate ethically for me to be demanding thousands of dollars for lost profits on that score. The client certainly deserves it, the law may support it, but ethically you may have a problem with it. It's just a consideration. Same thing if you're going to sue humane societies, which I've done. I may support them, they, be, they may be very good, but if they don't harm my clients, it's a bit of a conflict there. The animal community isn't just with it's also with humane societies and shelters and, and breeders and every other um, animal care control professional. So when you take action against one of your own, so to speak, it's going to impact your business. Finally, pro bono work isn't the only way to go. You can also do sort of pro bono. It's really just price it down, 30 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour. But if it's a guaranteed money, at least you're having some flow or showing some respect to Three substantive areas of law. I'm going to be, try to be quick. So, a lot of this is already in my material, so I'm just going to call your attention to it. Five causes of action. You know, in Washington State, we got our felony animal cruelty law with Sato. Sato was a dog breed, you know, a bell breed for other breeds. I won't go into the gory details, but it kills and hurts people. As a result of that, it led to such controversy. Two years later, in 1994, the Washington State Legislature passed our felony. It hasn't changed at all, but it did change um, this way. Max the cat. Now, Max, this is a picture of him. Um, he suffered extensive second and third degree burns. He'd been set on fire at, uh, at a middle school after being abducted from my home. He died from his injuries, but as a result, there were changes to a better area of the law. I think it was Senator McCain. So upset that the juveniles, he was 17 of them, the juveniles really received just a minor slap on the wrist. A lot of the times when men serve and this affects sentencing for juveniles who are charged, they see the same thing. And the changes are significant. It, it ranked up the severity level of the juvenile sentencing crime from a level C to a D, which affects the same types of sentencing that could be had. It also made it so that the even if they a deferral, a disposition. The conviction is non expunged. So it's going to stand. A couple of others as well. So in Washington, these are some of the changes. But what I did, I took a civil case as a follow up to animal cruelty, and I would recommend it because 
on the one hand, as you know, there are going to be collateral estoppel effects. So if you can prove, if, if the prosecutor can, can um, prove the elements of a crime of animal cruelty beyond a reasonable doubt, and it's going to just, um, slip, in, slip nicely into the civil claim, then you have certainly a standard of proof. Now, I ended up going to suing the police because the parents for a variety of abuse and statutory crimes dealing with the cat in the home. And one approach is by looking at the implied causes of action of the statutory regime. From Washington State, the case on point is Bennett versus Thompson. And Bennett really borrows from the federal test. The federal test is articulated in Cole versus Cole. Really three points. You've got to show, if you're going to try to imply a cause of action in a statute, you have to show that the point of the person is that the state has passed and be protected or benefited by the statute. And you have to show more or less that the legislature intended it, explicitly or implicitly, and that if you do provide a civil remedy or an implied remedy, it has to be consistent with the statute. This is how it is in most every state. So what do you look for? If you're going to try to build a bridge between an implied cause, of, between a, an existing statute and a new implied cause of action, you can look at criminal and civil codes, and I'd argue common law. Criminally, cruelty to animals, obviously that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a civil right of action concerning an for animal cruelty. In particular, focus on the factors that maybe the legislature wants to treat um, convictions in terms of consecutive sentencing instead of concurrent sentencing. It could indicate that they're treating Severe. Is there a forfeiture of animals? Is the defendant, the state convicted, forbidden from having animals in the future? Is there a lean on care expenses? The animal control and police may put out quite a bit of money. And veterinarians come in to save the life of that animal and that animal's interest after enduring animal cruelty. And the lien would be sort of slipped in as part of restitution for the animal. Civil penalties. Um, Washington State. In addition, if you are convicted of dollars penalty on top of it. Mental health counseling and expungibility. Is the crime going to be vacated during the time of removal or just declared for another two years? The criminal statutes and the pet theft statutes. Why are those important? Well, these often, at least in Washington, they will use the term, um, they'll talk about companionship. What is a pet? What is a pet animal? How is that different from a farm animal or a work animal, a service animal? statutes, what they do is there's a shift generally in the mentality. A shift in actually the whole, I guess I'd say even the hermeneutic of how you view this animal as property. On the one hand, it's not like a desk or a car or a computer because there's a unique relationship that is recognized by these statutes. Moreover, there's a pain and suffering framework. A framework of culpability that only applies to sentient animals. It doesn't apply to any other property because they can't what does this mean? Well, it means that you can draw some sort of an implication from it. And the implication would be, there are two implications. One, if the sensate nature of the property is recognized by the statute, then it's arguable that there's an implied civil right that is enforceable to compare the property. The same thing for unique uses of property in the sense of companionship. And there could be a similar civil right of that companion. Again, how are, how are the laws making animals as property uniquely different from non-animals? Civil codes. Some states have, have immunity statutes that say if an animal is going without food or water for a period of time, you may trespass to provide sustenance to the animal without being charged with injury or being liable civilly, you might be liable strongly, um, for that trespass. And that goes to show that there's a consideration of the animal's rights or interests above any property interest of the owner of the property. There's also a removal in the animal. There's like animal control officers in Washington. They can actually trespass and remove an animal if there's an immediate threat of death. Animal trusts, another area to look at. In Washington State, they actually allow completely unrelated third parties to petition the 
see if the best interests of the beneficiary animal are not being met. It's radical. Again, I think that goes to show the legislative intent. What is being applied? Service animal injury, civil cause of action. In Washington State, in your state may have it too. You can get attorney's fees, a thousand dollar penalty, and damages arising from the negligent and malicious infliction of injury to service animals. Also, criminally, right, let's go back to the history. They discuss value that's to be attributed in the event that a service animal is killed. Let's we'll say it's intrinsic value. Washington State, there's also a civil cause of action applicable to the livestock. This is what's kind of confusing. In Washington, sort of, I think it came out of a lot of mutilation. Uh, I guess it was rampant. There was people going around the animals and killing them. They captured them. And horse rustling. And so the, this is where the, the farmers and the agribusiness lobby did come in. And they got the legislature to do that. A couple damage to them. In Washington, we don't have is a very rare instance where you get up to treble and attorney's fees. There's a, an intentional slaughter or removal of a farm, but not for pets. Again, I'd argue that the, that the status of the law now, if we're going to recognize rights to farming, obviously has to carry over. Common law is another area. Pet bills, can you get them back? Well, in Washington State, there are cases that are a century old that tend to stand for the proposition that Injured by a hired veterinary professional that does not die. Half of the original value of the animal. However, if the animal does die, because you've tried to mitigate, you get the vet bills presumably up to the original value, plus the original value. So maybe double. Now, original value isn't defined, and it was a horse that was hit by a car, and the horse was a working animal, and it was in 1908 or but you know, that might provide a limitation. However, under the cruelty laws, you can be prosecuted if you fail to provide necessary veterinary care that results in physical pain to the animal. Again, that shows that there's a duty of care owed to the animal, irrespective of ownership of the animal. It even subjects the owner to criminal prosecution. So the Fifth Circuit in the Statement of Policy of 1909 in the real property context does allow for even if it costs more, much more, than the place of the animal. That I did see in one court case a judge applied that to the case of a dog that looked like that was far in excess of the original value. Destruction on death provisions, many courts say that those are invalid as a matter of law. In other words, when I die, euthanize my animal. When I die, you know, send my car to the wrecking yard. Most, most courts are going to say it's against public policy. In that sense, that tends to reflect a parental function of the state or, or a perspective that there should be no waste of valuable property. Best interest of the animal standard, look to family law. Uh, I cited a few cases that the judges actually employ it. Public trust doctrine, I got this from an attorney named uh, Yale Truck in uh, California. And uh, she recently took the case involving Ruby the Elephant down there in the Central Valley. But she successfully argued this public trust doctrine, which normally starts normally only applies to navigable waters, but she was able to get it extended to endangered wildlife. What does that show? Again, it's showing an implication. An implication that if the best interests of the animal are considered, there should be a civil right that's enforceable and it should be protected. Similarly, if property rights of others, like the owners, are suspended in lieu of supporting the animal, that should also support a civil right. You can analogize or you can improvise on it. Um, Analogies are pretty hard. You're going to get stared down and accused of all sorts of evilness if you try to say that a wrongful death statute, which normally applies to human children, should apply to non-human So what I always am careful to do is say, I'm not arguing that the, that the companion animal is a person, as intended by the legislature, but that it's a good analogy. Same thing with pre-death pain and suffering. The other option is, topic is, how do you combat cruelty in other ways? Traditional ways of combating cruelty are through political pressure, getting the media
media involved sending a bunch of letters. And educating law enforcement officers around the world. The number one complaint a prosecutor is going to be, the case was bad the second it was arriving on our desk. They, the officers did a poor job investigating the case, and we don't have enough to go forward. It's too late. The evidence is destroyed. That's, I think, the major reason why civil petitions aren't brought forward. But you can also try a writ of mandamus or post-civil service. Basically, these are devices, not just statutory, that allow an individual to petition the court to force a government entity or official to take action as required by law. It can't be a discre you can't force or compel a, a government agent to perform a discretionary duty. I suppose you could say, you must exercise your discretion. You must not abuse your discretion. But it's quite different than, than forcing them to do something that is a ministerial. With prosecution, as you know, prosecutors have wide discretion. They don't have to charge a crime if they don't want to. They're not going to tell them if they have to. Take a look at the state versus Kirk, Kirk here or versus Cannon. This is a Wisconsin case where it has nothing to do with animals, but the mother of the deceit of her son who was shot asked that the DA and it was not done. And so it went up on appeal and ultimately the court said that the decision by the prosecutor was purely subjective and it exercised his discretion not to do so for any reason. But it at least articulates how you might be able to do it in some cases or with, with statutes that use the word shall relating to prosecution. And then I just read Get it? Model protection. Uh, it's the article by Baru Shilakamari, and it's on taxpayer standing, a step, step toward animal centric litigation. Page 265, the author discusses a case in Ohio where, concerned by the method of euthanization under an Ohio statute, in other words, they were, they were not using sodium pentobarbital as a cause, this individual filed a taxpayer suit to county commission and the dog warning to stop the use of carbon monoxide exposure. Uh, that's another way to do it. You know, if you can't get the prosecutor to prosecute the case, you might be able to see a bunch of sort of a de declaration that a method of euthanasia violates the cruelty code. Okay, animal control officers also may have their own independent power to enforce your cruelty laws. Take a look at your cruelty to animals chapter. May not need a prosecutor. The ACO him or herself, or the Humane Society officer him or herself, may be able to file their own petition without any prosecutor. The Paws versus Culp case is in my materials as, as Exhibit D. This was in Washington State. Paws is the professional um, Progressive Animal Welfare Society in Linwood. At the time, Mitchell Fox, who was one of the founders, Mitchell Fox worked with John Costa, who recently, to file a criminal charge against an individual named Jack Miller. Jack Miller was with the Omax Stampede Association. Do you, do you know about the Omax suicide race? It occurs every year up in Okanagan County, sort of in the central part of Washington State. And what they do is they run horses down a massive, a very steep grade. And they call it the suicide race because a lot of the horses are going to die or be severely injured. Now, that doesn't mean the riders aren't going to get hurt too, but it's didn't ask to participate in this race. So there was an effort here to declare that that was animal cruelty. It wasn't subject to the rodeo exception, which, by the way, is what Fox is calling it, by the defendants. Well, Mitchell Fox, being a peace officer, a human society officer at the time, had authority, this was before Posada's law, to file a criminal information, and he did, all the way from Seattle out in Okanagan County. It was unfiled. Very strange. It was actually unfiled. The judges, the district court judges there, talked openly about the case, expressed their views on the case, and then uh, proceeded to white it out and send it back. Not, not accepting the case. So there was a writ of mandamus that was sought, saying you've got to accept it. You have to issue the summons to Mr. Miller. You can't go about um, conducting your court in this fashion. Well, as a result, the judges filed a writ of quill law and tow. A writ of quill law and tow, essentially arguing that the entity that is the petitioner is acting outside of their, their virus. They're saying that PAWS is acting outside of their, their proper charge.
harder to be held to the vote. So they said, you have run up to the Supreme Court, and a commissioner kicked it back. The Superior Court said, you can never vote for Since that, Since that case, Sato's Law came down, and everything was amended. And now, I believe, the right of an animal control officer to independently file does not exist. So your statement has to say that. Another thing is, look at the rules. This one blew, blew me out of the water. In Washington State, there's a citizen provision for petitioning the court to find probable cause and force the prosecutor to prosecute a misdemeanor crime. It's recommended if you're going to do it, that you know what the prosecution standards are. They should be statute, they should be codified. Be able to argue pro and pro and con, why it's more punitive. Make sure you got at least probable cause. Take your course wisely. And um, normally it's only for misdemeanors. Other misdemeanor crimes, like trapping on animals in the Humane Slaughter Act. Washington State has a criminal Humane Slaughter Act. The federal government, as you know, the Federal Humane Slaughter Act has no to stop the line. But in our state, it is a misdemeanor crime if they kill an animal. You might be able to prosecute the case. Well, prosecute the case. You won't prosecute the case. You will petition for the prosecutor. And the odds of the prosecutor will just figure it out. But at least it was that. New Jersey uh, has a private prosecutor statute. You have to actually petition the, the prosecuting entity to take the case. And if they formally decline, then they may give you surrogate jurisdiction. For instance, a shareholder or something to take it back. So you may have that. And like I cited to um, Amy Okrasinski. She gave a talk a few years ago in Dartmouth about a, just such a case she took. What I want to do is at least get to a video of the discussion. Um, the police shooting dog cases, there are some of the ones that uh, are highly publicized. The Patton smoke just came out last year, you may remember, it was televised. Ten Tennessee Highway Patrol shotgunned uh, a dog in front of a family on the side of an interstate. That case has been filed. I don't know what the outcome is, but I believe that one's a federal case. Amy Brown was out of Pennsylvania. People cite to it a lot because it's a federal case that recognizes an outrage claim for killing of an animal. And in this case, uh, Amy was shot by an officer. The crux of it was is that before he shot her five times, her guardian was apparently screaming at the top of her lungs, not too far away, through an open window, and screamed, don't shoot, don't shoot, she won't hurt you. He apparently paused as if he heard it and then proceeded to kill her most of the shots entering her as she was running away. Uh, the court did find that there was a Fourth Amendment seizure. And, and, you're gonna, and, and, and now it is clearly established law. Anytime there's a shooting of a dog, there is a seizure. Now, is it unreasonable? Is it a constitutional violation? Ah, maybe not. Qualified immunity, the reasonable analysis, they're all pretty similar. But at least in the Emmy case, and I kind of highlighted some of the cases that came in the Supreme Court, there was a seizure. Fuller, this is the this is the Washington this is the Ninth Circuit case that you need to know. Fuller versus Vines, a '94 case. Champ was shot on the property of the Fullers, and, and actually after he was shot, presumably on no basis, the officer then wrestled the son around, uh, or not the officer, his friend wrestled him to the ground. There, had a further confrontation, and the officer took the gun to his head and threatened to send him to the Needless to say, that resulted in a $143,000 verdict for punitive damages against the officers. There was a Fourth Amendment seizure there, and it was clearly established law that if you shoot a dog, Now, I want to show you a clip if you don't want to watch it. And, uh, it's a minute long. This is a real case. I want you to determine whether this is a seizure that is unreasonable.
to that in a second. The argument was is that the dog was charging, and the dog was vicious before it got there, and that he didn't have to use less lethal alternatives before shooting. But I want to. versus Garner. That's our Supreme Court case that says when you can use deadly force. You don't, you don't basically seize an unarmed and non-dangerous person by shooting him dead. Is a dog unarmed or dangerous? What type of warning is required to be given to a dog? We think we consistently can use the bridge case which talks about the use of deadly force against human suspects. Um, deadly force that's contrived, then that's going to be its own independent violation. Canines, the Ninth Circuit again, Miller versus Clark case. Yeah, Miller versus Clark. A dog that held onto a man's arm almost down to the bone for 60 seconds that was deemed not to be the use of deadly force. Um, as a matter of law in the Ninth Circuit, police dogs are never deadly force. So the natural um, conclusion would be is if police dogs are never deadly force, should not be be presumed non-deadly force and that there should be non-deadly force against them uh, under Tennessee versus Garner. The real crux here is whether the vigor of the analogy between human and people sex is as strong as I'm trying to make it. And I haven't found cases that say otherwise, but I think common sense would tell me that it's not the case. Another way to explain it would be, you know, if you treat dogs as the same person even as children, does that at all affect the use of force or the warning given or the alternatives that children under the age of eight can't be hurt by the mens rea to commit the crime. Key questions in dog shooting cases are not going to cover right now. But uh, I'm going to All right. <laughs> all right. Um, so the case that you saw here with Randy, you know, things that we'd all want to know. If you only saw a short clip, actually the video came out in like 60 minutes. So you can imagine, he's doing the same thing. Sit there, bark, 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 walk up to him, pulsey, officer deemed charges. Okay? On one hand, he was at the curb of the Maybe in a split second. Many police shooting cases, they shoot the front and the rear of the automobile. The dog just came out of nowhere, and I had to shoot. Officers are going to get it. They're going to have to fight against the dog. He's here 30 minutes with a basically useless stance. He had a gun at first, but then I tried to go back to his car and get my shotgun. And my shotgun are not loaded with Could have loaded with something better than that, which is something that I wanted to do in the case of the Yeah, good point. Good point. He was called, well, he called the animal control. And he, they, they took forever to get there. Number two, though, he's there in an at 11 o'clock. Apparently, this dog is down, down the street in another alley, standing in the corner of the street, in front, aggressively approaching. of the scene based on that, and his belief that this dog wants to be killed, but allegedly is not going to kill him. That's important, because the standard here is, is not subjective to the officer, it is objective. Federal qualified immunity is not just immunity. It is objective. It's a reasonable officer. It's sort of a good faith defense. If the officer, given what he knew at the time, had reason to believe that he was not violating the law, that is Another thing is, the owner was not on the scene. Now, in the Brown case, that's exactly what happened. He moved Brown's body. The mother was there, screaming at the dog, trying to reassert him. You have a case where your client is there yelling, or like in Champ Holdings, yelling at the officers, no, the dog's not going to do anything. He's trying to get the dog on a leash, and then the dog, the officer still shoots. That might make a difference. But here, there was no one on the scene. Um, in any event, these are all critical factors.
Adam. Adam, who shot that video? The police officer who was shooting the video? Um, this is more of a comment than anything else. Um, one of the projects I'm working on um, in Eugene right now is we're challenging uh, 164887, which is interfering with agricultural operations. So I've done a lot of legislative research on it because we're wanting to overturn it. But ironically, we've discovered that there's a possible pro-animal situation there, which is that the, one of the major rationales for passing this law was to they were arguing that there was a difficulty in assessing harm to the animals that were being harassed so that vandalism law didn't work, trespassing law didn't work, and so they went ahead and passed this, which has got this interfering, hindering, obstructing. So there was really a lot of discussion about har non-tangible harm to animals and how that there needed to be another law addressing that because it wasn't evident as it would be if you were hurting property. So they were really talking about a, somewhere between a person and a property, this whole area in between. So just one possible basis for arguing that. I think. Um, my question was, uh, do you find that there are certain civil cases that you bring that have a greater impact on legislation? Not yet, okay. but there's, there's always hope. To be involved in things like trying to force open the inner workings of an IACUC for animal research issues. Chances are you're not going to be able to work on farm animal issues because the farmers who are the ones who if anybody would have standing to bring a case regarding their animal are the ones who are generally hurting the animals. So they're not going to be bringing lawsuits. I mean, if you happen to find a farmer who's engaged in some court, sort of turf war with another farmer, maybe. But by and large, looking at hourly rate work, you're probably going to be looking at only at companion animal issues. And you still may need to take other types of cases to supplement your income. There's no guarantee you can actually earn a full-time living at it, and my best suggestion is if you want to try, you probably need to be in a major city so you have as many potential customers as possible to draw from as a base. And you want to set yourself up in a wealthy neighborhood, quite frankly, or some, some urban area with pockets of rich people who might be interested in spending money on these kinds of issues. Um, another possibility is to take contingency claims. Now, this, if you take cases that offer attorney fee provisions, it's going to widen up the amounts of cases, the types of cases that you take. Um, but you're still going to probably need non-animal cases as a source of income. For example, what are some types of contingency fee cases? Well, uh, most states have consumer fraud statutes. And most state consumer fraud statutes provide for recovery of attorney fees in the event of a successful outcome. So if you're looking, for example, at suing a breeder who is continually churning out defective animals that's got a lot of issues bound up in it, one of the issues is probably going to be a consumer fraud. Okay, so you can probably take a case like that if you're able to finance yourself in the meantime on a contingency fee basis because if you're able to prove your case and recover, there would be the possibility of getting attorney fees. Now, of course, the downside to the, the upside is you can take a wider array of cases than just the hourly rate. And the downside is you have to be able to finance yourself in the meantime, which means you're going to have to take other work, which is probably not going to have anything to do with animals whatsoever. Um, or you need to have some other sort of income coming in some form or fashion um, to be able to support yourself so you can make your monthly rent payments on your office and you can pay your monthly phone bills, et cetera, et cetera, until you're able to resolve the case and have that income come in. Um, and even on a contingency basis, you need to keep in mind that there's still a lot of types of cases, depending upon how your state law is configured, that you're not going to be able to take when they only permit recovery on the basis of, uh, attorney fees rather, on the basis of the total recovery. It's going to vary from state to state, but I practice those places expect you to work 70, 80, 90 hours a week. So if you're working 80 hours a week, 
If you can find time to take pro bono work, plus your 80-hour work week schedule, God bless and, and go to it. That can be very, very, very draining, because not many people can keep up an 80-plus hour work week schedule, plus cases on the side. And there's other considerations that you need to take into account at that point as well. When you work for other people and you're taking other kinds of cases on the side, it has to fit in with your firm culture. You know, if your partner loves hunting, they're not going to want you working on some pro bono project to try to ban hunting in your neighborhood. Okay? You know, if your firm represents Tyson Foods, they're not going to want you picking up pro bono work for farm sanctuary or you know, United Poultry Concerns. So you have a lot of considerations in that regard to take into account before you're able to do anything. So if your biggest you know, goal in life is you really want to work on farming issues, you can't, for example, go work for a firm that represents agribusiness. Um, the upside, though, of taking pro bono cases is that you really can take any case that moves your heart. It can be anything, uh, any sort of case, including types of cases that clients might normally pay for. For example, if somebody wanted you to set up a pet trust for their companion animals, you can take that pro bono if you want. But you want to keep in mind, too, um, you're running a business. And is there really a value to doing for free something that somebody would otherwise pay for? Um, types of examples I've got set up on the screen are sorts of things that clients normally pay for. And you want to keep those kinds of things in mind as a business consideration before you agree to go do whatever for anybody for no money whatsoever. Um, any nonprofit on the planet would love to have their corporate, have themselves incorporated and have them registered with the IRS for tax exempt status for free. Not just animal issues. Any nonprofit for any type of issue whatsoever would love to get help for free. The fact of the matter is if they don't get free help, they will pay for it. And harsh as it sounds, let them pay for it. You know, I think that part of the problem in getting society in general to accept this as a serious movement, as a serious social issue, is that for so many years everything has been completely underfunded and non-funded and is like a badge of honor to be poverty stricken. Part of what I personally believe is going to propel this movement into the 21st century mainstream is that everybody's got to realize that this functions just like anything else. It runs on money. And you shouldn't be afraid to know Illinois. So I'll, I'll use Illinois as an example. That's what I'm most familiar with. Medical malpractice. You're allowed as an attorney, depending upon what stage in the proceedings you get to, to take roughly a third of the award. Now that's fine if you're talking about a traumatic brain injury or a wrongful birth with a baby or something like that where you can anticipate a very large recovery. Um, so if you are in litigation for a year but ultimately you can recover a million dollars, most people, most plaintiff attorneys will take that risk. For an animal case, it's quite possible that you can litigate the case for a year or two years or more. And even if you get a phenomenal recovery in a medical malpractice case for a veterinary malpractice that was just an award in California. We're going to talk about that more in a little bit. The $39,000, which to the best of my knowledge is the largest veterinary malpractice award ever. So you take a third of $39,000, you're still only talking about $17,000 or so. The case went on for several years. So as a practical business consideration, you cannot litigate something for two or three years and then recover $17,000. You'll be out of business. You're not helping yourself. You're not helping animals. You're not helping anybody. It's a harsh reality. Everybody would love to help animals. But if you're going to do it as a business, you need to actually keep in mind business considerations. Pro bono. Very popular with animal rights. Everybody loves to take cases pro bono. I'm not. It's wonderful to do that. I take cases pro bono. But it's got to be a balanced portion of your caseload um, because pro bono is exactly what it says it is. You're not making any money from it whatsoever, which means you must have income coming in from other sources. You take a job with a large firm. You may say, well, I hate this large firm job, but it pays the bills, et cetera, et cetera, and I can take work on the side pro bono, which is great. In those instances, you can take any sort of case that moves you, no matter how, what other hurdles there might be you're not charging the client, that's usually the, the key to the courtroom door. They'll come and sign with you, but then you need to make sure that you're able to support yourself in some other mechanism. And you, and you need to keep in mind, too, if you take a job with a large firm, it still depends what the firm is. 
you know, you can take a job with some place and maybe make forty or fifty thousand a year, and you can have roughly a forty, fifty hour work week. And then yes, you might have time to do some pro bono. You're not getting paid a lot, but you'll be in, it'll be enough you can live. If you take a job with a firm where you're making a hundred plus salary a year, and the starting associate salaries now are up to major markets, somewhere's around the hundred and twenty-five mark. To value your services and get paid for your services. Not to say not to do any pro bono whatever. I do plenty of pro bono too. There's always going to be a soft spot in your heart for some whatever it is that comes along. But as a general matter, don't feel afraid to say, this is my time and it's valuable. Or if you want my professional advice, it's something that you should pay for. Okay. Now, before you take any kind of case, and I realize there's some people in here that are practicing attorneys and this is going to be old hat, and there's some people in here maybe considering what to do with themselves for the rest of their career and so hopefully this won't be old hat for everybody in the room. You've got to really consider the merits of the case. Okay? Look at the claim. First of all, if it's, an animal, if it's related to an animal and you really want to get involved in animal law, you need to kind of look at it and say to yourself, is this really an animal law claim or is it just a claim that happens to involve an animal in it? It may, for example, really be an American with Disabilities Act claim. So the guy gets turned down. You know, somebody, a uh, service dog is not allowed into a public accommodation. Is it really animal law? Well, it's got an animal in it, but it's really an ADA claim. You can still get involved if you want to, but it may not, the more you look into it, be the kind of case that you think you're taking on, just because it involves an animal. You have to look at the clients. What are the client's goals? Okay, if a client comes in with a really tragic story about something that happened to their pet and goal is to get a million dollars, you are not going to be able to help this person because no matter how horrific it is, they're not, nobody anywhere in any jurisdiction in the U.S. is getting million dollar awards for anything. You're not going to be able to help this person. Uh, likewise, if the client's goal is to be purely vindictive against the tortfeasor, that's not a legitimate purpose of the civil justice system and you need to be careful about that as well. So, you want to do your client screening just as carefully for this as for any other area of law, and you don't want to take cases where six months down the road you're going to be wringing your hands saying, oh my God, what did I do? Um, you, you may also want to look at what side you're on. Uh, one benefit, for example, to being in private practice is you can decide what cases you want to take and what cases you want to turn down. I know me personally, um, somebody will call me their dog has bitten someone. Maybe I'll take the case and maybe I won't. It depends. First of all, I don't represent dog fighters, or drug dealers. I do get those phone calls. And you know what? Those are hard cases to turn down because those people are willing to pay. And if they don't get their services from me, they're going to go to some other criminal defense attorney. And you know what? Criminal defense attorneys in Chicago, may you're interested in taking, is really going to determine how you need to structure your practice. Or, depending upon how much money you've got to play with, you may need to look at financial considerations first and then say, depending upon what financial considerations I need to make will determine the types of cases that I'm able to take. For example, if you want to look at it first from a substantive point of view, you can say to yourself, you know, what are the issues that move my heart the most? Do I want to be involved in, in dog fighting, animal abuse, cruelty issues, etc.? Do I want to really attack the issue of standing and try to be able to gain standing for animals through courts of law. Uh, you can look at it in terms of, you know, what types of animals do my, does my heart go out to the most? Do I want to help farm animals? Do I want to be engaged in wildlife issues? Whatever. So you kind of take a look at what is it that you really want to do the most. And what I say to people, not just, not, not necessarily even for, for practice in animal law, but as a general matter, when people say, well, how did you end up in this? Or what should I do with myself for a living? I always find, you, know, you say to yourself, what would I do for free? And if you can figure out what it is you would do for free, if you can make money at it, that's just gravy. So, the next thing that you need to consider if you're going to be in business is how am I going to actually earn money at this? And here's where the, the two kinds of concepts you need to look at sort of mesh and will probably conflict for a lot of people. Um, Animal law is a business just like any other sort of business, and you really do have to treat it that way. And
And if you want to take cases, for example, on an hourly rate basis, that's great. If you can actually find people to pay you money to do the kinds of things you want to do, that's fabulous. And there's some upsides to this, and there are some downsides to this. If you find hourly rate work, or rather if you take hourly rate work, you're going to be more likely to be able to pay your monthly bills, which is cool. We all want to be able to pay our monthly bills. However, it is probably going to significantly, significantly limit the kinds of cases you're going to be able to take. Chances are the only people who are going to pay you to represent them are people who are involved in companion animal cases because those are the people who view their animals as members of the family and would be more likely, if anything, to retain a lawyer for legal services on behalf of their companion animals, just like they might retain a veterinarian for medical services on behalf of their animals. So if you take hourly rate work, chances are you're never going to be